Well, good morning, everyone, and happy new year to you. We had, um, it's probably wise that we, we gave the worship team a Sunday off because they were working so hard over the holidays, but it, in retrospect, it was probably a good idea, so they didn't have to deal with the roads today, but thanks for being here. We're into a new year. I was reading Psalm 100, and the second verse I really like, it says, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. So let us sing our first song today with joy and praise. That's why we praise him. Please stand if you're able. Two, three, four. Came to live, live a perfect life. Came to be, living word of life. Came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise and show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship the King. Cause He gave His everything. Cause He gave His everything. He came to live, live again in us. He came to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go prepare a place for us. And that's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our this king cause he gave his everything cause he gave his everything hallelujah 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 for you today other than oh, sorry. watch it other than I'm glad that you decided to get up and come out and worship this morning um, we debated this morning Joe and I were talking since about 6 30 this morning on you know do we do we go online today do we just have second service today what what's the plan and we both drove out here and the roads were really good until like right here at the church and uh, you know what we said we said what would Miller do and we knew he would make it out through thick and thin, so we said, yes, we're having the service. That's really not what we did at all, but 
<laughs> we wanted you to feel good about it, Millard. Uh, but hey, we're here, and we're here to worship, and I am glad that you are here, and I trust that we will have a wonderful time together, praising God and getting into his word for us uh, for this first Sunday of the new year. Uh, I had a couple of thoughts about the new year. Um, I came across these, and I want to share them with you. I found that an optimist stays up on New Year's Eve till midnight to see the new year in. A pessimist stays up to make sure the old year goes out, which I think everyone probably has a little bit of that in them this year, like, see ya, 2020, we'll move on to 2021. Um, youth, and I thought about my children for this one, youth is when you're allowed to stay up until midnight on New Year's Eve. Middle and older age is when you're forced to. Uh, I made a resolution this year that I wanted to share with you. I made a New Year's resolution to lose 15 pounds this year. I only have 20 more pounds to go. <laughs> hey, where's, the, where's Tommy back there? Did you? Shh. All right. Anyway, again, thank you for being here. This is our first Sunday of the year. It is also the first Sunday of the month, which is when we would typically have our prayers for healing. Um, and so this morning, we're going to be extra mindful as we pray together for those who are dealing with situations where they need God's healing touch. That is not just for physical things. I mean, it certainly includes physical things, but it is also those who are spiritually hurting or emotionally hurting that just need God to heal their hearts. And it certainly, as I said earlier, includes those who are for prayers for healing uh, concerning surgeries or concerning illness that they're fighting through, whatever it may be. I think at this point, we all know someone who is dealing with uh, recovering from either injury or illness or surgeries. Uh, we've been sharing a lot of those stories the last few weeks about folks that have been asking for prayer. So we want to pray for those people and be very mindful of them. The Bible tells us that when we gather together in God's name, there he is. And it also tells us that when we offer prayer in faith, knowing that God is able to heal us, healing takes place. And so we go to him this morning and we ask God, for his healing touch on our country, on our nation, on our people, and on our family and friends. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you provided safety for our travels this morning, that we were able to come and gather here in this warm, cozy church and, and just worship and celebrate that you are a God who is faithful, that you are a God who is with us every step of the way. Lord, we usher in a new year. We are anxious, I think, and excited about what this year will hold. We never would have guessed this time last year what 2020 was going to have in store. But we do know who's in control. And so we will be able to find peace in knowing that we serve a God who heals. We serve a God who loves unconditionally. We serve a God who cares so much for us that he sent his son to take our place. So this morning, Lord, as our minds that sometimes may wander and we start to think about or worry about or dwell on the many different things that are going on around us or maybe the things going on personally in our lives, help us to find peace in knowing that we serve a risen Savior, a Savior who defeated death on a cross, and rose from the dead and sits on your right hand. Lord, help us to be mindful of those who are in need of healing. Some may be sitting in this room this morning, those that were not able to be here this morning but are at home or watching somewhere else. Lord, there's so many people who are dealing with circumstances that sometimes feel like they're out of our control scary diagnosis, fighting disease, recovering from injury or surgeries. There are so many things that people have to deal with, Lord, and we just lift them up to you. We pray for your healing. We pray that that healing comes in all the different forms and facets that you provide, whether it be directly from your hand in the form of miraculous healings, whether it come through the treatments provided by doctors, however you choose to work your will, Lord, we put it in your hands and we pray for your healing touch. And for those who are putting their faith in you this morning and asking for your help, 
we ask that you would give them a reassurance that you are listening, that you are their God, that their faith is exactly where it needs to be when they put it in you. Lord, thanks for loving us so much that you did send your son, that we can come and read your word and we can worship and we can sing songs about why we praise you and why we worship and sing because you are full of goodness and love and mercy. The Bible tells us that you did not send your son to condemn us. You sent him here to save us. If we ever needed an indication that you are indeed for us, Lord, we look at that cross and we remember what you did on it for us. Thank you for loving us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray together today. Amen. I was thinking about uh, a lot about this past year and, you know, dealing with loss of any kind can be overwhelming. You know, whether we lose someone because of the pandemic or uh, we lose a pet, we lose our job, or even just a, even a friend moving away could be difficult. Romans 8 Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Praise God for that. In the fertile soil of you Can't believe the hopes he's granted Means a chapter in your life is through But we'll keep you close as always won't even see you've gone cause our hearts are big and small ways we'll keep the love that keeps us strong and friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them and a friend will not say never Cause the welcome will not end Though it's hard to let you go In the Father's hands we know That a lifetime is not too long To live as friends Hard to let you go in the 
Father's hands we know that a lifetime's not too long. Live as friends, no lifetime's not too long. To live as Got to get myself situated here. You know what I just realized, Joe? And everybody? That this is not my Bible. This is one of the pew Bibles. And the marker that I put in my Bible isn't in this one. But that's okay. We found it. We're going to be reading from James, which is my favorite book in the Bible, and we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, just verses 2 through 8. It talks about trials and temptations, because we face those this year, and we'll probably face them again in this coming year. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word for us this morning. Now it's too high. Goodness. Last Thursday night, if you were one of those people who chose to stay up, or if you were one of those people who were forced to stay up, last Thursday night at 11.59 p.m., over one billion people across the world watched as the ball dropped in New York City's Times Square. That got me wondering a little bit about the history of this New Year's Eve ball, and what I discovered is intriguing, and I want to share it with you. The first time ball was installed on top of England's Royal Observatory in Greenwich in 1833. After the success of that event, approximately 150 such time balls were installed around the world, but few still survive today. The tradition is carried on today in places like the United States Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., where a time ball descends from a flagpole at noon each day. And of course, once a year in Times Square, where it marks the stroke of midnight for New Year's. New York actually held a New Year's celebration as early as 1904, but it wasn't until 1907 that they dropped an iron and wooden ball and adorned it with 125 watt light bulbs. It was five feet in diameter and it weighed 700 pounds. From that date until today, the ball has dropped every year except for two years, 1942 and 1943, during the city's World War II dimouts. Crowds still gathered in Times Square for those two years and greeted the new year with a moment of silence, followed by chimes ringing out from Times Square. Over the years, the time ball has undergone about four or five redesigns. The most recent one was created for the millennial celebration in the year 2000. It's a geodesic sphere, six feet in diameter and weighing approximately 1,070 pounds. It's covered with a total of 504 
crystal triangles that vary in size, and each of those triangles has a special designation. Hope for fellowship, hope for peace, hope for wisdom, hope for unity, hope for courage, hope for healing, etc. They all have a, a meaning, each of those crystals. The name of the ball itself, does anyone know what it's called? The Star of Hope. Why would they call the New Year's ball the Star of Hope? Because each New Year is time for hope. It's a time for opportunity. It's a time for each one of us to grasp and hold our future or our destiny. Proverbs 17 verse 24 says, Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. Now what we see in this verse is that we have the opportunity to grab a hold of our destiny and future for this coming new year. The hope for our future depends upon ourselves. But that hope doesn't lie within wishing upon a star, which is essentially what all those little triangles are on the star of hope. They're about wishing upon a star. Those hopes for fellowship, peace, wisdom, courage, and so on are not based upon promises, but upon a wish of what we'd like to see take place in the next year. Proverbs 24 is saying that the wise man has a powerful future waiting for him because he keeps his eyes focused on wisdom. By contrast, the fool has his eyes on something else. His eyes are on the ends of the earth. Now what's the difference between the two and how can we become like the wise man and get the best God wants to give us? How do we get that? Well, first, let's take a look at the fool. The fool's eyes, says Proverbs, wander to the ends of the earth. Now the verse interests me because I can visualize this kind of guy who's always looking for the next best thing, who's not focused. I remember hearing a story once about a woman who was picking strawberries in a strawberry patch. She would no sooner pick one, and she'd look up and see another strawberry a couple rows over, and she'd run over there and pick that strawberry. Then she'd look up and see another one a few plants away and run over and pick that strawberry. And again and again, all across the patch, she would jump around picking the strawberries. By doing this, she filled one bucket in the same amount of time a normal person could fill ten. Her eyes were always wandering across the field looking for the easiest berries to find. This is what the fool is like. He's always looking for the easiest berry in the patch. He's always seeking an easy way to get ahead in life. He's the guy who invests in the future by buying lottery tickets. He can't seem to stay married because no one person's ever good enough for long enough. He can't keep a job because no job is good enough. Can't stay in one church because no one church is good enough. There's always a rainbow waiting for the fool over the next hill. Their eyes wander constantly to the ends of the earth. They are constantly comparing themselves, their families, their jobs, and their potential to something else or to someone else. And because of that, they are never satisfied. Like the woman who hurried from bush to bush in the strawberry patch, they're constantly running from every aspect of their lives. They're always hoping that the next ring they grab will be the brass ring. And in the end, they have done less with their lives than they could have if they would have stayed focused. By contrast, the wise man has two advantages over the fool. First, he is focused. Sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom. That's what Proverbs 17 tells us. The wise man isn't running all over the place for an easy way to live his life. He realizes that the only way to achieve success in life is sticking to the task at hand. You can't build a championship team in one day. You can't have a single sales meeting transform your company into a success. A weekend marriage or parenting seminar can't completely heal a struggling family. And one sermon can't set a church right or remove its troubles. It doesn't work like that. You can't make a success of life by looking for quick, easy fixes. The greatest achievements can only be accomplished with consistent, focused effort. 
And that is what the wise man does. He focuses on achieving one central objective. The main pursuit of the wise man is more wisdom. Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs, one of the wisest people that we'll ever hear about or read about, Solomon, was once asked by God to name the one thing that he wanted. When Solomon asked for wisdom, this is what God's response was to him. It's in 1 Kings chapter 3. God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people and have not asked for a life, long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. Solomon learned from experience that wisdom gained him an advantage in life. It gave him an edge. And it was that advantage, that edge, that gave him his wealth and his power and his position. Because when we think about it, what's the purpose of wealth if you don't know how to spend it wisely? What's the value of power if you don't know how to use it? What's the use of having a position of influence if you don't know how to influence people? Too many people believe that if they only had power or wealth or influence, then they'd be happy. And so they struggle to try to gain those things. But they don't have the wisdom to know what they already have, and so they're never satisfied with what they do have. A discerning man keeps wisdom in view. That's the first advantage the wise man has. The second advantage the wise man has over the fool is that he knows where to look for this wisdom. Where did Solomon get his wisdom? He asked God. Why? Because wisdom comes from God. James chapter 1, verse 5, we just read it this morning. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Or in other words, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do with your life, you should ask Him. And He will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking Him. He will be pleased to grant you that wisdom like He was with Solomon. Now there are other places we can look for knowledge and information. Other places we can look for what men value as wisdom. And those places may seem to be logical at times, I admit that. But any source other than God will eventually lead to a contradictory advice because it will be based upon man's experience. I want to repeat that. Any source other than God will eventually lead to contradictory advice because it is only based on man's experience. Let me give you some examples of how man's advice eventually leads to, con uh, eventually contradicts itself. Here's some examples. Look before you leap, but he who hesitates is lost. Many hands make light work, but too many cooks spoil the broth. Clothes make the man, but we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, but it's better to be safe than sorry. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, but let's not beat a dead horse. If you lie down with the dogs, you'll get up with the fleas. But if you can't beat them, join them. All these are wonderful things that we like to say, advice that we like to give, but eventually our advice contradicts itself. The wisdom of man has its weakness because man's wisdom is always based solely upon what mortal men and women can experience and observe, and because of this, our experiences will always be limited. It's like a man wanting to see as far as he can. So he climbs a high mountain and gets to the top of the mountain so that he can see as far as he possibly can. But guess what? You can still only see so far. He'll always be limited by his own eyesight and the edge of the horizon. But by contrast, the wisdom of God comes from far above. There are no limits to God's vision. There are no boundaries to what he can see. He knows the beginning from the end. In Isaiah 46.10, God tells us this, I make known the end from the beginning, the ancient times, what is still to come. 
I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. In other words, I think what God is saying is only I can tell what's going to happen even before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish. When we look to God for his wisdom in our lives, we're not only better off than the fool, we're really better off than anyone else because we have an advantage that others don't have. We have access to the wisdom of God in our own personal lives when we ask for it. And we show that we have the wisdom of God when we do what he asks us to do. So this is the second kind of important part. We ask for wisdom, but then once we receive it, we have to act upon that wisdom and do what God is sharing with us or calling us to do. Remember, Jesus once told the parable about how two men built their homes. I loved this story as a kid. Remember we sang the song, the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came down, right? Remember Jesus tells this parable, and he ended the parable by saying these words, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. But, but, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. We demonstrate as followers of Christ, we demonstrate that we have gained God's wisdom and it influences the decisions we make and how we live and how we act. We demonstrate all that when we do what God's word asks us to do. When we do what God has asked us to do. That's why it's so important that we keep exposing ourselves to God's wisdom. We do it by opening our Bibles. We do it by coming to church and worshiping together. We do it in Sunday school when we have it. We do it in midweek small group Bible studies when we're allowed to get back to those. We do it in our own personal devotional time if we participate in that at home. It's important that we continue to surround ourselves with God's wisdom. The more of God's wisdom that we can get into us, the greater our advantage will be in this world because a more of an understanding of this world we might have. So, here are the ways to ensure a good new year for 2021. I mean, if I'd have told you this last year, maybe we'd have had a better turnout. But So for this year, we're starting it off right. Ways to ensure a good year in 2021. Number one, know God's wisdom. Ask for it. Read his word. Understand how he works. Know God's wisdom. Not, not earthly wisdom that comes from man's experience. No God's wisdom. Number two, do God's wisdom, if that makes sense. Carry out what God puts in our lives. Follow his word. And number three, repeat. Know what God's desire is for your life this year. Know where true wisdom comes from. Carry out the things that God teaches us and puts on your heart, repeat. Do this again and again, as often as you can. The key thing to remember is that both as individual Christians and as our church, what we need to remember is that we have access not only to God's wisdom, but also to God's power. Do you believe that this morning? We have access not only to God's wisdom, but to God's power. Our ability to create a great new year for our lives isn't limited to what we know, to what we personally can do with our lives. It's not limited to that. God's power and his working in our lives is the single most important advantage that we have. As one wise man observed, I place no hope in my own strength nor in my works but all my confidence is in God, my protector, who never abandons those who have put all their hope and thought in him. If we hold on to God, to his wisdom, and to his power, then we will succeed in this coming year. And we will be able to grab a hold of everything that God wants us to have this year. It may seem that our future may be in doubt at times, as we struggle 
through varying circumstances in life, but in the end, when we think about eternity in heaven, when we think about eternity in heaven with God, our future is really never in question. We give God thanks for that good news today. Seek God's wisdom. Live out God's wisdom in your life. Repeat. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we once again give you thanks for this Sunday morning. Lord, thank you for each individual that's sitting here this morning. Thank you for those who are watching from home. Thank you for the privilege it is to read your word, to learn from it, to apply it to our lives, and to see the fruits that it bears. God, our, our lives are better when we live out your will. When we ask for you to lead and we actually let you do it. Life is better that way. Your word tells us that when we are living within your will, that's where blessing takes place. So help us. Help us to seek your will in everything that we do. Let us be open to listening to your voice, to hearing your calling that you put on our lives. Let us be like Solomon and, and ask you for the greatest thing that we could ever ask for, which is wisdom and understanding. Because all the other things that we strive for in life, status and power and money, and none of those things matter if we lack wisdom. Let us understand what your wisdom is all about. Help us to see the world through your eyes, to, to look at other people and realize that they need to be loved and cared for. Help us to see the rest of the world the way you see it, not the way we see it. And guide us to be your hands and feet here on earth to reach out to those who are lost. Lord, we come here each Sunday because we want to grow. We have a desire to do your will. We, we mess it up day in and day out. We make mistakes. But we come back each week and ask for you to help us try again. And this morning we do that. We pray that you will help guide us and lead us. Let us step out of our comfort zones and share the wonderful news to a lost world. That hey, if your faith and hope and your eternity is in Jesus Christ, there's nothing this world can throw at us. There's nothing this world can do to us that can take us away from that eternity with you. We love you, Lord, because you loved us first. We ask all these things today in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. That's a great New Year's message, Pastor Keith. Thank you for that. I was thinking about the, the last song that we're going to do and thinking that many of us carry with us worries, hurt, shame, anger, sin. And I was reading Paul's words in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Uh, Keith introduced me to this song back in 2015, right after I had uh, retina detachment surgery and feeling pretty crummy. But um, uh, this song gave me a lot of hope. And so let's stand and sing our last song, Cast My Cares. When fear feels bigger than my faith And struggles steal my breath away Pressed up against the wall With the weight of the worries Stacked up tall You're strong enough to hold it all Soul. This war's not worth
would I would have chosen You see the future no one knows yet And you're still good when I can't see the working of your hands You're holding it all I will cast my cares on you You're the anchor of my hope The only one who's in control I will cast my cares on you I'll trade the troubles of this world When I lay it all on your shoulders Cast my cares, I will Cast my cares, I will Cast my cares on you Cast my cares, I will Cast my cares, I will Cast my cares on you Cast my cares, I will. Cast my cares, I will. Cast my cares on you. I will cast my cares on you. Cause you're the anchor of my hope, the only one who's in control. Cast my cares, I will. Cast my cares, I will. Cast my cares on you. Amen. I'm glad you came this morning. Please be safe on your travels home from yes. here. It's a little slick out here, but it looks like it's starting to melt away. I saw the salt truck go through, but thank you for coming and choosing to get up and worship this morning. I pray that this year will be better for each and every one of you, whatever it is that you're each going through or dealing with. And I pray that you will learn to trust in God's wisdom and cast your cares on him, for he cares for you and will help you carry them. Thanks for being here this morning. You are dismissed. I will cast my cares on you. You're the anchor of my hope, the only one who's in control. of this world for your peace inside my soul cast my cares I will cast my cares I will cast my cares on you